Hello, Asheville. You are listening to WPBM 103.7 on your dial and at WPBMFM.org globally. I am your host, Crystal Salinas McKinnon, and today we are continuing our series of interviews for the NC11 congressional race with Republican candidate Eric Batchelor, who's joining me remotely. Eric is one of four Republicans taking on incumbent Madison Cawthorn in the Republican primary. Please note that you can also view this broadcast on the WPBM Facebook page and website. So Eric, welcome and thank you for being here to share your platform and campaign with the community and giving getting to know you a little bit as a candidate. Thanks for having me, Crystal, and hello, Asheville. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm gonna break from my usual format here because there is just so much going on here locally in the district and, of course, in the world, um, from the floods to uh, Afghanistan to our current um, representative making some big noise in the last couple of days. Uh, he, I believe, do you know, was he in Yancey County uh, yesterday when he basically asserted that he's an insurrectionist? Um, I thought it was... Macon County, but I okay. I, I, Not that I, it's I, hugely I, important, I but so this went viral. Yes, um, and uh, it's pretty crazy. So he basically said uh, he was speaking at an event. Somebody yelled something out to the effect of, uh, "When are you calling us back to Washington?" Implying um, to storm the Capitol, I suppose. Uh, he said something to the effect of, uh, we're working on that, and we'll let you know. And then he commented that a lot of Republicans don't want to talk about these controversial issues, and uh, then goes on to express pretty clear sympathy for the insurrectionists, implying that they're political prisoners, um, that they're being denied their rights, etc. So this is uh, one of three crazy things he's done in the last 24 hours. What do you think, Eric? Um, I look at this through the lens of a law enforcement officer because I am a deputy sheriff. And when I look at the video from January the 6th, I don't need to listen to commentary. I don't need to see a written story that goes behind it. All I have to do is look at the video. And on the video, I can pick out individuals that if they were here in our county doing the things that they're doing in that video, that I would arrest them for assault. I'd arrest them for breaking and entering. I'd arrest them for trespassing. I'd arrest them for larceny. So I'm gonna leave it to the legal scholars to define what exactly it is because I think that's probably a little above my pay grade, but I know what I can see in the video. And I know that what I see is people conducting criminal acts. Absolutely. I think that's pretty clear. Um, it's interesting that they even had to have hearings about it to interpret the video. So the <clears throat> second really fun thing from our current representative was when Lieutenant uh, Marine Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller uh, put, put out a post, um, I believe, on Twitter saying, follow me and we'll bring the whole effing system down. Cawthorn then reposted it asking if anyone has his number. So these are both, both of these things are clear and open threats to our democracy, to our capital. Um, he then put out a TikTok threatening the president. So even though you yourself are a Republican, do you how do you feel both as a candidate and as a citizen to have the person that represents you in Congress at this current time speaking sympathetically and about people storming our, our capital, something that has was totally unprecedented in American history? Um, it seems to me that it's fundamentally un-American. How do you feel about it? I say that we have a system that built to address uh, when we have an issue with our government and violence is, is not the way that we do it. And I am, and I will say too that the Marine Lieutenant Colonel, I can't remember what his name is, 
uh, I was disappointed to see that because in the military, there is a, there's a time and a place and, and there's a method for talking through these issues. But the way that he did it, uh, I just disagree with. And Cawthorn, um, his support of that, to me, just kind of shows his immaturity. He does come across somewhat like a child when he's talking about it. <laughs> so I would tend to agree with you on that. And he's also been very vocal about the situation in Afghanistan. And that was um, tied into his threat directed at the president, Joe Biden, saying that he's coming for him or we're coming for him, whoever we are, uh, to make him pay for the 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 terrorist attack in Afghanistan and the loss of 13 American lives. How would you respond to that? Do you think that Joe Biden is directly responsible for that? There's an enemy in Afghanistan that is responsible for those deaths. Okay. And laying that at the foot of someone else, I think is wrong. I disagree with Biden continuing on down this subjective timeline for how and when we withdrew our soldiers, withdrew American personnel from Afghanistan. He is completely responsible for that. And, and I think he does share uh, part of the blame, but laying down American lives at one person's feet kind of it, it kind of takes out of, it doesn't take into account all of the other underlying issues associated with it. Uh, you know, and, and I tell you what, I will, I do hold him as the president responsible for it, but we remove him from office by voting him out of office the next time around, not by making threats and not with violence. So on that note, let's talk about Let's talk a little bit more about Afghanistan then. Do you, how do you think that we should have done this differently, this withdrawal? I mean, I don't know that anything we could have done would have prevented the possibility of a terrorist attack, especially because to my understanding, this is a new cell that was not um, very well known prior to this, prior to their state taking uh, responsibility for it. Uh, so yeah, how could we have done this better? from your perspective as a 20 plus year veteran of the U S army? Well, honestly, in my opinion, <laughs> and this goes back to a lot of what ifs, ands and buts. If we had insisted as we did going into Afghanistan, creating a long-term presence, conducting the nation building operations that we did. Okay. I think that, Unfortunately, once we signed on to that, we were stuck there. Uh, you know, we, we pulled out of Korea or we pulled out of the Korean conflict about 60 years ago. And guess what? We've had a garrison in Korea to help maintain peace for about 60 years. And nobody likes it. It would have been expensive and it would have cost more soldiers time away from home. But there is no reason why we couldn't have done something similar to that in Afghanistan to maintain a presence, to maintain a launching pad, and to uphold the Afghan government, Afghan military. Uh, we've, again, we bought off on being there, so maybe that was an option. Now, if we were gonna pull out of Afghanistan, again, it, like I said before, it's not based on a subjective timeline. You know, I keep hearing we want to be out, or I heard several times, we want to be out by the 20 year anniversary. What does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything to the terrorists that are over there trying to conduct operations. It doesn't mean anything, you know, in real life. If we were going to pull out of there the way that we did, then we needed to have objective milestones that facilitated maintaining uh, security, maintaining peace, until we had all of our assets out of there and also taking into account Afghan civilians and all the Afghan military police 
and, and everybody else that helped us while we've been conducting operations for the past 20 years. So it seems, I think it's kind of interesting because the, <clears throat> the vote to repeal the 2002 Iraq War Powers Act was bipartisan and the current representative Cawthorn voted in favor of it as well. So does it seem to you that there was a consensus that maybe a bipartisan consensus that's to, to some extent to, that we should, we should pull out and now we did it and maybe, you know, there was some tactical things that could have been done differently, but it seems that overwhelmingly Americans did not want to maintain a presence there. But then they're sort of outraged by the, the consequences of pulling out as we did, even though I think that's, everybody was aware that this was, that we were just going to pull out and leave. And Trump was advocating for the same thing. Do you think he would have done anything differently? Like from a tactical perspective? I, I really don't know. I, I couldn't, I couldn't comment on that. Um, you know, but I will point out that I do believe him wanting to pull out was a political decision, just like Biden's. And, you know, going back to something you said a second ago, you said that you think that overwhelmingly Americans uh, don't want us to be over there. And I would disagree with you. I don't think that Americans even thought about it at this point because the casualty rate was so low because it wasn't, you know, Afghanistan really wasn't on the news. And, and, it, and that's kind of why I go back to it. We signed off on this 20 years ago when we went in and stayed. Honestly, I feel like we should have looked at an, as an option, leaving a footprint there that gave us flexibility in the region. And if we, you know, if we kind of accepted that as a, just as a price of doing business for the military over the long term, I, I think it would have just been viewed again as a, just like our forces that we've got in Korea right now. And to your point, <clears throat> I'll admit that I could be in a political silo <laughs> where I think that pe more people are aware of something than they are. Um, because I, I follow it and not everybody I know does. So that's distinctly possible. But so on that note though, should we have been there in the first place? I think we absolutely, excuse me. I think we absolutely should have been there in the first place, not to stay. Um, after September 11th, we had, I feel like the duty to Americans, we had the duty to the rest of the world to disrupt operations out of Afghanistan, uh, but to also show terrorist organizations around the world that you can't do this and get away with it. And I do believe that we should have gone in there, conducted limited operations uh, against named targets with, uh, with defined goals, and then told the Afghan government what there is of it. Don't let terror cells operate out of here again. If you do, we'll be back. And I think that would have given us, or we would have maintained uh, the ability to move throughout the globe to intercept these kind of terrorist organizations instead of getting bogged down there in one place. Uh, and it just would have given us flexibility. What do you think about the, so we obviously we had this, this terrorist attack um, just a few days ago and in Afghanistan, and there was a great loss of life, both for American soldiers as well as Afghan people, innocent people. And in our, t Biden has already asserted that there will be consequences for this terrorist attack, which I take to mean they will bomb them <laughs> and so do you do you agree with that do you or do you feel like that's just perpetuating it or you know do do we need to assert ourselves by retaliating for that i absolutely believe that we have to retaliate for those deaths do you feel like this is going to 
like I said, just kind of keep us in this endless cycle or where does it end? Or maybe it doesn't, I guess. Maybe I just answered my own question. No, I, I don't think it does. Uh, you know, in the military, we don't, we don't do things. We don't make decisions based on just one or two factors. When we, when we decide to do something, we, we conduct what we call a mission analysis. We look at the who, what, when, where, and why. We try to get to the real root of what a problem is. And I think that if we did that kind of with some new eyes right now, looking at what's going on over there and, and try to develop a way ahead that would keep us from getting into that what you're describing, this endless loop. Um, you know, I think that we could clean this up, but it really, it's really, it really needs to be a conscious decision and not just uh, based on emotions, which is kind of what I feel like is going on right now. Maybe just like too much politicking around it. Yeah, there, there's absolutely too much politicking around it, but it, this is a, what I see going on over there right now is if you take politics out of it, it's a military problem. And if we, again, if we did some analysis and try to get the, to the root cause of it and look at some different options, I do believe that we could clean up what's going on right now without getting into an in this tit for tat cycle going back and forth. Okay. So, um, We'll come back to a little some international stuff, but I just wanted to cover those things um, a little bit right, you know, off the bat because of your your experience. And, um, you know, you were obviously in the war for almost its entire lifespan. So you have, uh, you know, a unique perspective on that. And our current representative has his own unique perspective on many things. And I felt that we needed to kind of clear up how you felt about a few of those things. But um, so you've said that you had wanted to, you'd known for a long time or a while that you had wanted to run for Congress at some point, but you hadn't originally planned to do it so soon. Um, would I be correct in taking that to imply that Cawthorn himself was the impetus for you jumping in at this time? Yes. If we can talk about we can talk to, about that at a little more length, or we can just let it go at that. Either way, you want to go. Well, um, I think we can kind of go, we'll we'll touch a little bit upon him when we get into your platform. Uh, so, you know, we've obviously talked about the fact that you're a retired U.S. Uh, Army Lieutenant Colonel. Can you walk us through? some of your career highlights and what you've been doing since you left the military and how you got to where you are now. <laughs> I can absolutely do that. So I graduated from North Georgia college that is now known as the university of North Georgia in 1995 with a bachelor's in criminal justice and a commission as a second lieutenant uh, in the infantry. I, after I graduated, I went down to Fort Benning, Georgia, where I went to the infantry officer basic course, then completed ranger school, and then the infantry mortar leader course. I was down there for about a year. And in April of 1995, I went to my first duty station in Hawaii. Uh, while I was in Hawaii, I served as a infantry platoon leader, a mortar platoon leader, and a long range surveillance detachment executive officer. And during that time, I also married my wonderful wife of the past 24 years. And after that, uh, we spent the next, what, 17, 18 years traveling around the country. We, we were stationed in Georgia a couple of times. We were stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington, stationed in Alaska, which was my, one of my favorite places to live, and uh, stationed in Kansas a couple of times and then finally retired as a lieutenant colonel. I have combat deployments to Iraq, Afghanistan, and Africa. My last, my last duty station I as a lieutenant colonel, I was battalion commander for 2nd Battalion, 16th Infantry Regiment out of 1st ID Fort Riley, Kansas. And 
I deployed with that battalion to Africa for nine months conducting operations. So uh, while I was in the Army, I decided pretty early on that it wasn't anything that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. It wasn't the only thing that I ever wanted to do. Um, and so I sort of started creating this bucket list of things that I wanted to do after I got out. And going back to my criminal justice degree, I knew that at some point I wanted to try law enforcement. And so that was the first thing to show up on my bucket list. Uh, the second thing was being a paramedic. I had a, a particularly bad day in Iraq one time where one of my privates got hit. And unfortunately for him, I was the guy that was there with him by myself for about the first 30 seconds and it felt like about 12 years and after that happened uh, i decided that i wanted to know how to do more than just stop the bleeding and keep an airway open so that kind of led into uh, eventually one of these days i want to be a paramedic so that was the second thing on my bucket list and then when i was a young lieutenant colonel uh, i'm sure that you remember when uh the embassy in Benghazi was overrun by terrorists and at the time Obama was president. And after that happened, I remember him saying, we are going to make Africa a priority. And I remember looking at my wife and, and I said, you know what? He just made policy. And I don't even think that he realizes that he made policy. And I don't think that anyone's going to really know what to do with that statement. And so sure enough, over the, over a little bit of time after that, you saw the uh, Department of Defense and the State Department both kind of trying to figure out what that meant. And, and as a direct result, I ended up with my battalion in Africa because one of the things that we were tasked to do was conduct uh, a quick reaction force to uh, reinforce embassies in case something like Benghazi happened again. But the whole, my whole point to that is, is I just knew I could do better when it came to speaking, when it came to making policy, especially when it comes to policy that affects um, service members, policy that affects our armed forces, because these are, there are real consequences uh, when we talk about this and there's real, there's real people that pay for those consequences. And so then that became the third thing in my bucket list. Well, when I retired in 2015, I immediately went through the pipeline, became a paramedic. I worked as a paramedic for a few years. I, I'm still uh, certified. I love, uh, I love the fact that as a paramedic, you can go and help somebody and, and usually see pretty immediate results from it and know that something you did just helped. And, uh, but it wasn't, it didn't quite scratch the itch for me. So then I was like, well, maybe it's time to move on to law enforcement. So I got my law enforcement credentials and I came to law enforcement. And I am with people in law enforcement that much like I was with in the army, people with a very uh, strict sense of duty, people who, uh, who believe in what they're doing, people who you know, I believe, I believe have a lot of character and integrity. And I know in this day and age, uh, there are a lot of people who mistrust law enforcement, but I'll take a second to plug, you know, law enforcement is just a cross section of society. 99.99% of law enforcement out there, they just want to do the right thing. They're there to serve. And I challenge people to find someone with the character to do this job where the pay is low, the, your, your health suffers. Um, some people don't appreciate you all the time. Uh, the, the hours are horrendous and sometimes you get shot and that's really not a whole lot of fun. Uh, because I got shot in July of 2020 and I got shot, uh, I got hit in the humerus I, uh, the bullet completely destroyed my left humerus. I had four operations. I had two plates, a whole bunch of screws and a bone graft on my hip. Uh, I've probably had hundreds of physical therapy, occupational therapy sessions. 
And uh, here about two months ago, I finally got cleared to go back to full duty. But during that time, just like a whole lot of Americans, I st started paying even more attention to politics than I normally do. And I started watching Madison Cawthorn rise. And honestly, I just see someone who is extremely immature in a very powerful position. And it goes back to what I said several years ago, I can do better. And so this was, I saw this as an opportunity while he is in his uh, first term. Uh, hopefully we can keep him from getting entrenched in that office and get him removed. Uh, so I will uh, encourage anyone out there, vote in the primary. Let's get some adults in the general election next November. Maybe somebody who's at least had a job before, um, served our country, had a job, went to school, at least one of the three. All three would be great. One of the three. <laughs> so well, there's, there's four people that probably meet those requirements that are waiting in the wings to challenge them in the primary. And that's, again, why I say the primary is so very important. And, and that's where people have got to show up in numbers and vote. Right. And so on that note, are you, what is your strategy in the primary as far as our, you know, we, I think we kind of know that there are, there's a certain faction of people who cannot be swayed on, I, on both sides. Um, so are you kind of counting on quote unquote traditional Republicans who are, and, and independents who are uncomfortable with Cawthorn's image and his performance? I am. The, before, I even, before I ever even announced, I went and sat down with Chris Cooper, who is a pretty uh, recognizable name in politics here in Western North Carolina. And he and I talked about those numbers and what's out there. And our conversation led me to believe that we do have, there is a path to victory. And the path to victory is those people who are, again, like you use the word traditional Republicans, I think. And, and I think that that's a lot of who it is. But it's also a lot of people who voted for Cawthorn who aren't happy with them. My time, uh, we just had the, the county fair this past weekend, talking to people there and, and talking to other people as I've moved around the district. There are people who aren't happy with them. Who did vote for him last time. So I think you even got some of those along with our more traditional Republicans and our unaffiliated uh, voters. When you look at those numbers, the pathway is there. The numbers are there. So if you were to win, how would you differentiate yourself from the Democratic uh, opponent when most of the Democrats are running fairly moderate campaigns. Well, the the thing about it is, is I'm still a conservative Republican, and but I'm a conservative Republican that's willing to compromise, to reach across the aisle, to do these things to actually make things happen, not dig in and refuse to do anything. This is what bothers me right now about our Congress, both on the left and the right. When you look at the when you look at the extremes, they've dug themselves in, they've entrenched themselves, and they in both of them, you know, kind of have this rhetoric of I'm fighting for you, I'm working for you, I'm protecting your rights. And and yet to go along with it, they're not actually doing anything because nobody from the other side will reach out and to them and actually try to work on something, you know, and there's, there's so many issues out there that are nonpartisan that shouldn't even come into play broadband for one. And sorry, I'm getting a little bit off the subject, but, Go ahead. but it's, broadband is one of the things that I've been spending some time talking to uh, board members from different counties who, who have been working on the broadband uh, issue. And it's been really interesting to learn about it. Uh, and how it how it affects the district, but its connection to back to the state and back to the federal side to kind of learn what's going on and what the root cause of the problem is. 
and, you know, and something like this shouldn't even be a partisan issue. But for these people who dig themselves in on either side, I, I think that they'll make it a partisan issue. And it shouldn't be because there's people out here that depend on it. They need it. They want it. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a critical thing. I think most campaigns are at least addressing it to some extent because I feel like the pandemic really brought that issue to the surface more than it had ever been before. I was not aware of it um, being, you know, that I live in Asheville in the city. Um, I had no idea how many people didn't have broadband and it was a massive issue as we know in our rural communities, um, particularly for school children who had difficulty attending their online classes for lack of internet connectivity. Um, well, another, another big one that I didn't realize until talking to some of these board members was telehealth because mm -hmm. hospitals didn't want people coming in at the height of COVID. They were doing these online uh, appointments. And when people don't have broadband, they can't, they can't do their medical appointments. And it's one of those things that you don't even think about until somebody brings it up and you go, man, such a it seems like such a small thing, but for somebody out in the far western counties of this district, it's huge. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of the the people, the folks that are out in our uh, more rural counties and communities, um, those people are often you know left out of the political process, and I think probably that our our not really realizing the extent to which they were suffering with certain issues until the pandemic brought them to the surface is a really good example of the ways that they do get left out. And then just in that same way, they get left out of the political process and, you know, a lot of times just sort of dismiss. So what's your approach to reaching those folks? Well, I've kind of, I've kind of reached this mentality of I'm probably not going to outraise or I'll spend Cawthorn when it comes to money. Uh, he's going to invest a lot of money here, but what I'm going to do is invest a lot of time. And this weekend, the fair was kind of a really good trial in person run for me and my wife to talk to people, to have conversations and that sort of thing. And what we kind of realized is that's a great opportunity, but what we really need to do is, Start going out to these communities. Take a day, take two days, go out, walk down Main Street, walk into businesses, talk to business owners, talk to people who are actually working on the ground out in these counties. I'm going to go ambush county commissioners. I'm going to go ambush sheriffs. I'm going to go ambush fire chiefs and, and spend a day, two days out west in these counties just talking to people, hearing what's on their mind. And I think that that's how you get them involved. I think that's how you let them know that you want to hear what they have to say is just investing that time. And that's what I'm going to do. And that's what's going to set me apart from Madison, who's going to continue to fly around the country and raise national campaign dollars. Instead, I'm going to be here in the district talking to the actual district. All right. So you, speaking of being available, that's one of the biggest parts of your platform is just being available to your constituency. Um, you know, so that people being able to access your, um, your team or you yourself. And you also say, you know, you want it to be normative to be seen in the district that you represent. So do you want to talk, go ahead and start to talk about that part of your platform? And I think you're kind of you know, making a big differentiation here between yourself and Cawthorn by making it clear that you're going to be available, you're going to be easy to access, you're going to spend your free time in the district when you're not in Washington, and you plan to actually vote and do your job. Well, you, you kind of said it all there, so... <laughs> <laughs> no, I... I appreciate you bringing that up because it is, it, it's what is so important to me because this is one of the things that has absolutely appalled me with our current Congress people. Um, again, on both sides, it's not everyone, mm -hmm. but there, but there are these handfuls of people that number one, when they're not in DC, they're traveling around the country looking for the next photo op, looking for the national campaign dollars instead of being back in the district. 
And that's number one. And number two is it, when they are supposed to be in Washington, they're not. Madison has the worst voting record of any freshman congressman. And I think his quote was something like, I wasn't going to be there to vote on that because it was some sort of democratic crap. And if that's really the way that he felt about it, I would have preferred that he had been in his seat and voted no on it and actually represented me and other Republicans or whoever, just representing the district by being there voting on it one way or the other. So, so thank you. That is, that's number one. So being in Washington, doing the job or being here in the district, when I'm here, here in the district, I want to be available. Um, so I want to kind of look at how I would set up a website to make it easy for people to contact me. If you go to other uh, senators, Congress people, representatives, if you look at their websites, it they're not user-friendly for getting through. At least I don't think they are. Again, I'm not very much of a techie, so maybe it's just me. But I want to have a website that is user-friendly for people to get through and send a message to me and my staff. That's number one. Number two, district director. District director is the most important hire I see in the future. If I get elected to this job, it's getting somebody that knows this district. It's getting somebody that knows how to work. Somebody who knows how to work hard. Somebody who is willing to be on the other end of the phone and answer a phone call from a constituent and answer and get to the bottom of something for them. And if I need to get involved in it, then they get me involved in it. So it's having that district director. A third thing is, and this is something that I want to do on the veteran side, being a veteran myself. I already have someone in mind to do this, who I'm not going to dime out quite yet, but I have somebody that knows the veteran system, knows how to get veterans in, in contact with organizations, agencies, v, BSOs to help them out when they need it. And this would, I foresee having this kind of full-time, part-time position that is a one stop go-to resource for veterans in the district so that there's somebody on the other side of the phone who has done this before, knows where to go, you can get them in contact with who they need to. Um, and then just, and then just going back to, I've got this plan in my head. I've got this circuit that I see when I'm back in the district, when I'm not in Washington, I see this circuit physically across the district that I'm running, going and talking to sheriffs, going and talking to county commissioners, going and talking to fire chiefs, going and talking to business people that, uh, that have an in with their county that can tell me what's going on for businesses. And, and I just see when I'm here at home, I can see just doing this circuit around the district continuously to hear what people have to say. Then after a while, just like you said, it, it's normal for me to be there for me to be in a restaurant in, in, uh, in a County, uh, in, you know, somewhere in Murphy for me to be somewhere having lunch. It, it's not a, an opportunity to take a picture and post it on Facebook. It's just the norm. And, and that's what I'd like to see as an in-state. So um, you say that you would, I, you would kind of rely a lot on taking, maybe taking the temperature of the community, like through, you know, the law enforcement, the, the fire department, et cetera. Um, so let's go, into emergency services, which is one of your next uh, platform points. So you do obviously make it clear you don't want to defund the police. I'm shocked, Eric. Um, <laughs> I'm scandalized. Um, I myself did a research project in grad school that was somewhat related to this. My findings were that, and there's plenty of other people who've studied this, majority of people black and white do not want to defund the police. However, they do want to see, um, they do want to see reform. Uh, not, not everybody, but I'd say about half of, half of people. Um, can you talk about how you would address these issues, approach these issues, um, and kind of, as, in your role, maybe help the communities to, in, in the district to mend the maybe fraught relationship with law enforcement that some people have? at this time? <laughs> well, first off, let me say, yes, I, I have seen the same statistics that you have seen on defund the police, but it's not 
when you talk about defund the police, we're not talking about just monetarily, financially, you know, equipment and people. We're not talking about getting rid of the police. What we're also talking about is let's get this language defund the police out of our, out of our language. Let's stop using those, that terminology. And the reason I say that is because it's very demoralizing and across the country, we've got evidence and even right here in Asheville of losing law enforcement because of morale. It's yes, there's regular retirements as people change in jobs. It's, you know, whatever, whatever, but morale is one of the biggest things that I continue to see brought up as a reason for people leaving law enforcement. And I, and I tie it right back to this defund the police. You know, all you have to use is those words and and there's a lot of connotations that go along with it. So I'd really like to see that get out of our language. And it, and to me, it goes all the way up to the top. It goes all the way to the presidency of let's stop, you, you know, don't encourage the use of this language. Let's get rid of it. And let's talk about how we support the police. Okay. And I think that, And I think that the way that we support police is we get law enforcement out of the the uh, business of doing things that we are not trained, we are not manned, we are not equipped to do. So one of my one of my examples to this is um, people who are in mental health crisis. Okay, there are some cities across the country that are starting to experiment with having. Uh, mental health teams respond to someone who is having a mental health crisis rather than law enforcement. Now, let me be very, very, very clear when I say this, because people will turn it uh, out of context. This is not talking about sending a social worker to someone who is barricaded in a house with a gun having a mental health crisis. This is What they've done is they have 911 dispatch centers. They have these questionnaires that they can run run through and it helps them to decide, is this a violent or a nonviolent crisis? Do we need to send law enforcement or can we send a mental health team to go do this? And, And maybe even, hey, we go ahead and send a mental health team, but there's a cop waiting around the corner out of sight. Because so many times when we get called to go to someone who's having a mental health crisis, we show up there in uniform with a nice shiny badge with a gun on our hip. And guess what? It gets worse. Now, you know, we've got mature enough people in the office that they are able to calm people down a lot of times. And and we can, we can talk them down. We, we have that capability, but there's, Somebody else would could be so much better equipped to do it than we are, because there are going to be those times that it just does get worse because we are not the right. We're not the right thing that they need to see when they're having a crisis. And so that's kind of that right there is one of the biggest places that I could see, you know, how we protect law enforcement, get them out of doing jobs that they don't need to do. You know, and another uh, another uh, problem that I won't get into quite as much detail is the opioid epidemic. Okay. We are very good as law enforcement being the hammer to arrest criminals when they are making meth, when they are running meth, when they're dealing in it, when they're running uh, components for it. Yeah. We're the right answer for that. We're the right answer for keeping those people out, keeping those people in jail, but the addicts, the people that have this much on them when we see them, they've got a problem. And continuing to go in and out of the, the uh, prison system, it isn't the answer. And so there's got to be there's got to be some other system be put in place to get these people long term help so we can stop arresting them and concentrate on the real problem. I, I like that answer. Um, so let's go on to the second amendment and, um, I was going to insert this earlier, but I just wanted to clarify to folks when you did, when you were shot, you were shot in the line of duty by an AR-15, um, which was being carried by a felon. So 
I think everybody in this race on both sides supports the Second Amendment because you cannot represent Western North Carolina if you do not support upholding the Second Amendment. Uh, However, it kind of wavers in the depth of the background checks, methods of preventing guns from falling into the wrong hands, um, what people should uh, be having what guns, uh, depending, you know, like how high powered, high powered rifles, um, automatic weapons, etc. So how can we protect these rights um, for our citizens here and also work to get guns off the street, such as the gun that you were shot by? Yeah, so I think that we've got about 15 minutes left, so I'm never going to be able to get into yeah. that. That, uh, that I'd like to be able to. So, yeah, I'll start off by saying I will never, ever be a part of gun grabs or anything like that because I do believe that constitutionally the people have the right to keep and bear arms, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that we should allow criminals to have firearms. Okay. And so it goes back to what you said. Yes. I was shot in the arm uh, by a convicted felon with an AR 15. I don't blame the gun. I blame the person who had it and I blame the system that allowed him to have it. And in my mind, you know, and I'm still kind of, we, I don't think we've quite gotten to the bottom of exactly how he came up with it. But we are the greatest nation on earth. Surely we can figure out a system to keep hand or to keep weapons out of the hands of people who don't need them without infringing on the rights of law abiding citizens. And and I think it is a mix of applying the background checks that we have now. It is without uh, again, infringing on people's rights, but but there's got to be some sort of way that we can access mental health records for somebody who has a history, a history of mental health issues, not just they had a bad day one time, but a history of issues and kind of put those two, that criminal background check, that mental health background check together uh, so that we keep them out of the people out of people's hands who don't need them. And then we strengthen the laws surrounding uh, punishment for those people who end up with them and people who facilitate them having them. And also taking those, you know, when we catch a convicted felon with that AR-15, then that AR-15 is now off the street. Uh, and he is off, or he or she is off the street. So, you know, I think it's just, it comes back to strengthening what we have in place now and actually making it work for us. Okay. So your last two issues, which we have to, well, luckily we've already touched on a lot of the immigration and national security. I'm going to wrap them together because they're intrinsically tied. Um, So we've talked about, you know, Afghanistan and kind of your general thoughts on the overall war on terror. um, And you've, commented on the recent terrorist attack. I think the other interesting thing going on in China, I mean, in in Afghanistan is, is China. Um, And, you know, they're expanding their belts and roads initiative. And they're hosting the Taliban as honored heads of state and making deals with them. They, And I like to point this out that anyone who says this is a holy war, it's it's no different than any other power grab because they agreed to the Taliban agreed to cut to to leave the Uyghurs out to dry their fellow Muslims who live in the Xinjiang province of China in exchange for doing this deal. So that to me right there just eliminates the possibility that this is a holy war. Um, What do you think China's motivations are? The Belts and Roads Initiative is really 
hotly debated. Some people think it's a positive thing for global growth and accessibility. And then some people see it as a form of imperialism. <clears throat> wow, I wish we had more time to talk. Um, <laughs> so let me start off with, let me start off with this. And I have, I have, I think we have lost sight of the fact that we have across the world near pure enemies, Russia, China. Okay. We've also got Iran, North Korea, but Russia, China, let's talk about China real quick. So China is doing a very good job right now of using the levers of the dime. The dime is something that we talk about in the military, the D I M and the E it's the diplomacy information, military, and economic levers of national power. These are the levers that our federal government uses to flex its muscles across the world. And you can, if, if you get, if you take time to try to understand those and you watch what we do, uh, watch what our federal government does, watch what other countries do, you can, you can see where you can start siloing uh, actions in each of those, the D I M and E. Okay. Now, right now, China is, they are using those levers and they are using them well. Uh, because when we think about China, we can't think about just the country in, in Asia and what they're doing there. Look at China and look at what they're doing across the, the Pacific ocean. And again, as you say, when you start talking about the roads and belts, down into Africa and down what we're seeing in Afghanistan now. And I don't know if I would, I don't know if I would necessarily call it colonialism. I would just call it imperialism. Well, that's I what I did call it. I thought you would call it colonialism. Yeah. I mean, I would call it uh, imperialism because they are flexing the D I M and the E across those nations. And, you know, and they are, when I was in Af in Africa, you saw them there doing the thing that they're doing in, uh, in Afghanistan. Now they are, they are creating partnerships with African nations to mine materials, minerals, to make money. They are advertising it across Africa. Look what we're doing for you. They are working with African heads of States, uh, in the, dip the diplomatic, arm and guess what their military is involved there you know and i think that we're going to see the same thing in afghanistan because uh afghanistan has these huge supplies of lithium that is a major component of electric cars uh, so you know, it's not a huge leap to think or to figure out what are they doing there right um so do you think that this sprawl is does present an imminent threat to the United States and Absolutely. its interests. Absolutely. You know, because again, it goes back to, they, you know, it, it may not be that they ever use the M, the military of the dime against us, but they might use the economic one. In fact, I, I'd say that most of this roads and belts, you know, kind of goes back to the economic uh, lever of national power if we really want to peel back the layers on it. I also wish we had more time because I could go on about that. Um, and I really like to talk about what we might need to consider doing, but we don't have time. So if you have any thoughts on that, maybe you can comment them on the Facebook page underneath this post. Um, I'm just gonna go through a couple other things really quick because we just have a couple minutes left. Um, let's talk about healthcare because that's important, I think, to most folks. And we have a lot of uninsured people in our district and, and um, you know, hospitals moving out of the rural areas, et cetera. So I'm assuming you don't believe in uh, Medicare for all, but it's pretty, yeah, we have a problem. So what do you, do you have any thoughts or plans on how we could possibly close the gap for our folks here in the district who are currently um, not insured or underinsured? Well, I, I will back up a, a little bit. The, 
and say that I was, I really was disappointed with the Affordable Care Act when it came out because it was so rushed. And I don't think that it fully took or that it took fully uh, all of the issues at stake. Uh, I don't think it really addressed them. Okay. So something needs to be done to, and I don't want to really say replace or whatever, because that's expensive too. I don't want to, sp I don't want to throw more money at this uh, because we've only got so much to spend. Um, our deficit is starting to keep me awake at night, but, but I do think that we need to, we do need to figure out something. And I don't, we certainly don't have enough time here to talk about it, but the, everybody's different. Uh, and I've said this before, the single mother of two who works two jobs to put food on the table and provide for her kids, her medical care needs look very different from a single 50 year old male who is in the top uh, tier of earners. Okay. And so I don't think that we can come up with this cookie cutter uh, requirement for either or. I think that we've got to offer some options, some options that are affordable, some options that are that are within physically reach. Because again, this goes back to way out on the western side of the state, there the physical capabilities or the, the healthcare facilities, there there's less of them than what we face here more on the eastern edge of the district. So we've also got to take that into account. So, you know, unfortunately, as much as I'd like to talk specifics, I just don't think that we have time to talk Do you too think much because it is such a big, it is such a big problem. And, but yes, uh, it does need to be addressed. I mean, just, you know, quickly, do you think it would help if the North Carolina state legislature would accept a Medicaid expansion from the federal government? I don't know. I, you know, I haven't looked at, I haven't looked at what that would do uh, financially, but I think that no matter what, I think that that's a state decision to make. I don't think that's a federal one. All right. Um, and we really don't have time to dig into anything else. Is there anything that you just want to touch on um, quickly here in the next couple minutes before we wrap up? Well, I just, well, first off, what I will say is I hope that, I hope that this gets to the right audience. I want to say thanks to all of the, uh, the emergency workers, all of the first responders that have been here, uh, operating in our County for the past couple of weeks. The, uh, as you know, we've experienced some major flooding up in our Crusoe area, uh, over in Canton in Clyde. And it's just really taken a toll. And the outpouring from across the region, across the state has been absolutely fantastic. And I appreciate so much people being here to help out with that. Um, and uh, so yeah, just thanks for that. The, uh, and, I, and what I do wanna talk about is, this is a time for a representative, a congressperson to step up. There are people out here right now who need help. They need to know what levers to pull. They need to know who to reach out to as they're beginning to rebuild. This is when we could use some help from across the state and from the federal government to help people get back on their feet and offer some options. So uh, not to tell people how to do their job, but do your job, get involved in what's going on here. And you've posted some information that people can find on your Facebook page as well. Um, regarding resources. So um, I'll give you a chance to tell folks what where to find that in just a second. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Once again, you've been listening to WPVM 103.7 on your dial and globally at WPVMFM.org. Thank you again to NC11 Republican Congressional Candidate Eric Bachelor for joining me today and sharing his campaign and platforms with the community. Eric, do you want to let the listeners know how they can find uh, your information or reach you? Uh, the best place to go is go to ericbachelorforcongress.com. That has links to my Facebook, to my Twitter, and it has emails to get email addresses to get hold of me and to call my uh, call myself. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today and make sure to tune in for 
uh, we're cut off. Okay, but that's fine. We got it. <laughs> that was good.